I think that's all that everybody heard yeah. uh, the other day. It's like, oh my God, she pooped. The stream is not made for kids. Um, nope. Looks like that happened, right? Looks like that happened. Yeah. <laughs> okay, class. I'm not quite sure at this point what your um, preferences are in terms of how you like me to do this teaching thing and how you prefer that I don't do this teaching thing. Hi, Jessica. How are you? Good. It's wonderful to see you. Did you finish that video yet on how to give a good speech? No. You'll only you'll you won't need it until August. Perfect. Um, and so I'll just kind of see what happens with this one. And when we last were here, did you get a chance to watch the YouTube video of the last one? No, I couldn't find it. I like Googled, I looked at your name. It's not Are you on private? Yeah. No, no, it's, it's, on it's not public. I looked at my phone, phone my friend. Yeah. Um, this is a follow up to the conversation about getting content out there. Also put it in a place where people can actually find. That's a good. <laughs> that's a good idea as well. Don't bury it on a server somewhere. And, uh, you know. Is the handle Dr. Paul Fitzgerald? I don't know. I'll tell you. Yeah, we'll find out here in a second. Uh, I think there's Paul Fitzgerald. I think there's an old link to an old one in a Canvas module somewhere that you can link to a set from. Yeah, it's just Paul Fitzgerald. He's got three subscribers right now. Yes, <laughs> I'm one of them. Yes, <laughs> I've gone up uh, fifty percent the last uh, <laughs> the last week. Fifty percent subscriber growth in the last week, I'm up to three. Um, so when we were last year, Kate, Kat, for your um, edification, we were talking about uh, the cell cycle, interphase, mitotic phase, how you progress through it, and I made some big, um, some big fancy promises about um, talking about cancer and what happens when we get cancer. And um, I don't need really to spend a huge amount of time on that, but I do want to kind of follow that loop up just for a quick second. And I think to do that, I will go back to um, the previous image, which I kind of like. Yeah. Uh, I remember that one. That was a good one. Does everybody remember that one? That was a fun one to draw for me. Ooh, this looks familiar, right? That's a big circle, right? Cool. And um, there's one more stop that we can put in here. So when we were talking about the stops, we were talking about how you don't always like whip around this thing in sort of a non-pausing sort of way. This represents like the cyclical nature of the progression of cells within us and all that other kind of fun stuff. Ultimately, with cell division happening where the cells divide and one of them does its thing, the other one does its thing, but that thing is doing this again. Um, but not all cells are just sort of moving through this in a clockwise like way. Most of them, not all, but most are paused and we call these stops. And there's one right here um, near the end of G1 where it's like, okay, everybody hang out, everything is fine. We don't need to progress through synthesis in energy two unless we're going to divide. So unless stimulated to divide, we're just going to like pause right here and wait for a chemical, hormonal, whatever signal um, to go ahead and progress through this. There's another one down here at G2, um, which is, okay, let's stop, let's pause, let's share, make sure that we have everything we need in order to make it all the way through mitosis. Because if we only have enough to get to like here, we're not going to make it. So it's like we want to make sure all of our bags are packed because as we enter in the mitotic phase, the first thing we're going to do, yes, is bundle up our DNA, thus making it nice and efficient for sorting out, but making it inaccessible to read. So no more protein synthesis happens after you get past this point. So you make got to make sure, like the proteins that you need in order to get through telophase, you can't make them an anaphase. You got to make them over here, right? To go get through telophase in the beginning of G1 when you start to unwind you. You need those proteins made over here. So you need to make all the proteins it takes to get you to here. All right, so let's just pause for a moment and make sure that we have everything. Good? Right. There's another stop, um, third one. It's right here. It's um, after minute, minute, um, 
metaphase before anaphase. My convention has to draw little stop signs like that. I've either drawn the stop upside down or I've written my mitotic phase upside down. Um, as mitosis proceeds, you go through prophase where um, all the chromodomes condense, condense up and the nuclear envelope breaks apart and you have these nice passage things. You go through metaphase where the duplicated pro chromosomes line up in the middle uh, along what's called the metaphase plate. And they get ready to sort of separate out to other sides. So you've duplicated over here in S. You've made a whole other copy of your DNA and then you're gonna separate that DNA here. So in metaphase, you line everything up so everything is paired up and then you, you separate. In anaphase, you will pause here in metaphase as everything literally lines up in the middle of the cell before they separate out. So there's a little bit of a pause to make sure all the chromosomes are organized, make sure all the chromosomes are sorted out, lined up with their appropriate partner so they can, when they separate, they're all do so all at once in a fun way. So you have not one, but not two, but three full stops in the cell cycle. You have the G1 stop, you have the G2 stop, and you have the metaphase stop. So what happens if during the course of your life, you smoke a lot of cigarettes, you get a lot of sun damage on your skin, you uh, consume a lot of stuff that ain't so hot for you that binds with your DNA or in strange, curious ways or something like that. And sometimes those molecules that interact with your DNA, they just like happen to hit the parts of your genome that affect and control whether or not that stop goes up or down. All of a sudden, uh, you get some DNA damage that destroys the body's ability to turn that stop on. And that one, and that one. You hit the gene where you lose the stops in the cell cycle. What happens then? You end up populating too much. Unregulated cell growth. Unregulated cell growth. You refer to those as tumors, right? If they become independent and start to go around the body and break off, um, we call them malignant metastasized tumors. This is the nature of any cancerous cell that is out there, is you would lose the ability to actually regulate the cell cycle in a formative way. So the stops no longer stop, and you just get unregulated cell growth um, through time. And then those cells can start doing really strange things. Um, they'll start secreting um, like hormones, that result in like circulatory system elements like capillaries and stuff to start sending blood in that direction. So they, they start to get preferentially oxygenated by your bloodstream and things like that. It's like once they lose the stops, they sort of go on the Darwinian lamb. They, they kind of start to um, say, you know what? This whole, I mean, the only reason this works on the best day is because my different body parts are coordinating with each other in an effective way. All the cells are working together to do a common thing, mostly. You with me? Liver cells being liver stuff, kidney cells doing kidney stuff, intestinal cells are doing intestinal stuff, and they're all doing that for the greater socialist good. You with me? Bless you. It was a silent but sneezy tree pollen. <laughs> um, everything is working together so this thing continues operating. Everybody has a part to play. What if you're like, you know what? I can do this better than everybody else can. I'm just gonna do it all on my own. I'm gonna go my own way. And you start like, no, screw this kidney BS. You know what, I'm gonna go ahead and just like be a cell on my own again. Uh, I'm tired of my genome telling me what to do. I'm tired of these cells around me telling me what to do. I'm just gonna like, just start reproducing on my own because I can do it better than everybody else. And then essentially what you have is you have a Darwinian interloper. So you have all these things that are coordinating, communicating with each other, but now you have a couple of cells which are no longer working towards the common good. And so what medical science says is, okay, those cells need to go. There's two or three ways we can make that happen. We can irradiate them, we can surgically remove them, or we can chemotherapy them. Because everybody's gotta work together here or we're gonna have a real problem, a real problem. So it's essentially the, the case where it's all, bear with me on this one. Here's my contentious, weird, revolutionary thought of the day. Um, it's almost like you've reproduced. One, one, one individual has become two. 
the somatic operating self that all works together towards your reproduction and, and longer life and all that, and your cancerous cells that are all of a sudden working for their own reproductive success and development. So it's like, okay, you whatever cancerous cells are, you need to go, right? Because we can't do both at the same time within the same somatic self. You with me on that? It's usually a problem with the cellular stops in the cell cycle. Okay. If cancer is unregulated cell growth that just happens to the body, what differentiates a tumor from like malignant and benign? Like, you can have a benign tumor, unregulated cell growth. Um, the, the benign tumors don't really seem to be interested in this, like, super slow growth. They're not breaking chunks off and invading other cells. They're not um, attracting circulatory system elements to themselves. They're just using what resources might be locally available. You're probably still going to get it removed, right? Um, but it's like it's not really it's not co-opting other systems to grow its own unique self. The malignant ones to do tend to do that. It's like they'll they will start taking resources away from other parts of the body. And how do like doctors when they do a, like a check like a they can see if your tumor is malignant or benign. How do they know? I'm not sure. I never had to do it. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. It's a good question. It's a good question. Uh, are they producing the, the hormones that attract circulatory system elements? Are they? It's probably the, they, the types of cells that are. In yeah. When, when they subdivide, do they do they stop growing or do they keep? Because it brings in a circulatory system and all that stuff. Because that's a good question, though, Because I know for my mom, they finally got her glioblastoma with. Um, Medication that killed off the blood supply. That's a brutal to one, tumor. too. That's a brutal one. Yeah. Jeez. So. Yeah, that's a brutal one. Oof. Oof. That's rough stuff. Mm -hmm. But um, it's, it's sort of, it's an act of cellular selfishness. You know? And when you think about, like, what actually causes. So it's like, you smoke a lot of cigarettes for 20 years or whatever it is. Um, I know a person or two who have died of lung cancer for because they smoked a lot. Um, the nicotine molecule is really, really flat. Like, it's, like if you looked at it in geometric space, it's very flat. And it actually, um, uh, nicotine, you know, remember NAD, our friend NAD? Nicotinamide, right? It's, a, it's like a nicotine derived sort of thing. They interact really well with DNA. And it's like the nicotine molecule will literally slide between two nucleotides in the DNA strand. And you get miscodes um, as the DNA polymerase and the RNA polymerase kind of runs runs over it. It's uh it's, it's pretty pretty wild stuff. Solar radiation, it's just like it's just sunlight damage, it's just tearing up your DNA, you know. So um, you can handle a little bit about that. And the raise your hand if you've ever, I don't want to do in this case, because the question is raise your hand if you ever had cancer or cells in your body. And every one of you would then raise your hand, including me. We all have. Um, most of the time, overwhelmingly, your immune system does a really good job of recognizing when a cell or a group of cells has gone on the, on the loose and, you know, taking it out like they would um, uh, an invader or a parasite. Um, so if, if a, a malignant tumor has developed, right, that really is operating so independently that it's going to be a problem, um, that means your immune system has not quite caught that one in time, you know, but your immune system catches cellular miscreants all the time and this like usually, you know, lices them into destruction before they ever actually are able to do anything. So thank your immune system. For that, the same immune system right now that is identifying tree pollen as an invader, that's trying to get it get it out of your sinuses. Yours and mine. Yours and mine. So I may be thinking about this completely wrong, but I just want to like just see. So like the same way how if we get a cut or a bruise or something like that, and our body automatically tries to like heal it, does the same thing happens to our organs? Like if we um, like if we have someone that's a smoker. Right, and they smoke daily, you know. But after a while, they stop. Yeah. Um, does your does the, the process of that trying to heal could that also cause cancer as well? Or not that I've heard of, not that I know of. I mean, your body certainly does try to heal itself, you know, um, for sure. I'm not sure, but I mean, when when you damage yourself, like you get a cut in your skin or something like that, you're gonna divide. You're gonna divide cells. 
they're going to fill that up again. You're going to stitch things back together again. You might grow some new ones, all that kind of stuff. Great. Um, you can donate parts of your liver. This is one of the few organs where you can do this. You can donate a lobe of a liver, and like it will grow back in you, and it will grow a new liver in the recipient because like liver is just really growing. You know, it's like it, it, it's one of the few organs you have, not the only one that will actually like literally regrow, which is pretty wild. Most organs don't do that. You can't regrow kidneys, right? You don't regrow parts of the kidneys. If you're going to do a kidney transplant, it's like a cat and a kidney. You get the whole thing or you get none, right? You don't get half a kidney like you get half a liver, you know? Um, but, I mean, so there's this, there's this time in your life of your body when your cells are told to divide. Um, and that's great if they do it in a regulated way um, to a definitive end where there is a set predetermined point at which cell division will shut down. It's like after that, after that is healed, right. we're gonna stop because we're done dividing. As long as that is in place, and that goes that is in place by you know the stops re uh, reasserting themselves, everything is good. Um, if that doesn't happen, right, that's a, a time when you might be talking about like a tumor situation or something. But I've not heard of that in the context of, of healing before. It's like I meant, you know, I scraped my arm and I meant to put a scab on it and heal it, but instead now I have arm cancer. You're right. Um, I've mean, not heard of that. <laughs> I've not heard of it, but um, that's not to say, you know, through rounds of repeated damage, but I mean, through rounds of repeated damage, malign cell growth can occur. I just thought the right. same thing with like, I thought like your cells would try to like, like not replenish or make your lungs better, and in the process you end up having a lung cancer. I don't really. I've not heard of that. Yeah, I've not heard of that. That's a good question, though. Um, but your your lungs certainly. To circle back on a question I can't answer, your lungs certainly do heal themselves after you stop smoking. Um, you'll cough up some stuff that you never want to see again for a month or two afterwards. Um, but after a while, you can regain full lung lung health. You know, and with regard to like so, I mean, I talk about these because they're the big ones, right? Um, solar radiation and skin cancer. I, I guess I only talk about these two because there's, I don't know how true this is. These are sort of the two cancers that you can really feel like can you do the most about, but like don't smoke and put on sunscreen or, and don't get sunburns. Skin cancer, it turns out, this is a couple of years ago, this research paper came out. Whether or not you get skin cancer really seems to be tied not to like how much, like you ought for in the summer, you know, I went out in the garden a couple of times. It's starting to show up a little bit. I'm starting to get the tan a little. Ooh. Yeah, it's this one. <laughs> Watch. <laughs> the spring break, it was really dark. Um, it's not like I go out for, I, got, I get some sun for a half an hour a couple of times a week out of the garden. That, that, that's not what gives you skin cancer usually. It's how many times you got absolutely cooked when you were a kid. Seems like how many like really bad sunburns did you get me? Anybody get a lot of really bad sunburns when they were growing up? That is freaking anybody out by saying that. Anyone? Keeping, keep, keeping your hand up if you freaked out, if you freaked me out just by me saying that. Right. You're fine, Ken. You're fine. Um, I did, I mean, I did too. But it, like, it seems to be people who end up with like, you know, I had this growth removed from my whatever on my skin. Uh, it tends to be had a lot of sun, like a lot of really bad sunburns as a kid is where a lot of that seems to go. So, so what do you do about that? I want to give yourself a look over every once in a while. It's not a bad thing to do for everyone. You know, it's not a bad thing for everyone. I realized about halfway through that if I keep talking to people in this room, that might have that experience, you know, freaked out. And I understand why. I understand why. But there are other things that we'll get into now, segueing into the Professor Mendel and heredity, which I've been talking about for about two months now. Um, where the viewpoint that we might have on how genes in your genome operates might be a little bit different than the way Gregor Mendel sort of envisioned and presumed. And what I mean by that is that we oftentimes, when we're in um, any academic collegiate or high school learning environment, and we're learning about heredity, and we're doing Pundit squares, and we're doing all this kind of dominant recessive stuff. Anybody do that kind of stuff before? And you're comfortable doing it again? 
perfect, perfect. Um, we get these sort of notions that I'm going to have four kids and three of them are going to have blah, 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 and one of them is going to have blah, 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 and everything is going to be great. It's dominant, recessive. Um, the dominant one drives the show on what phenotype I get, what traits I get. The recessive one does not appear in the phenotype, whatever. Is some of the uh, best descriptive ways sometimes how genes operate, but it is the most simplistic ways that you can imagine the genome, so much so that if you actually look at your physical form, you can identify maybe, um, if you really look hard, maybe five or six traits of all of them on your body that actually satisfy Mendelian rules of heredity. Everything else is just a lot more complicated. Everything else is a lot more complicated. And has anybody ever done, this might be a weird question, this might be none for everyone, like the 23 and me, you spit in the tube, you mail it in, you an answer back and you find out what your traits, you find out whether or not you have blue eyes and all that kind of stuff. As if the mirror wouldn't tell you. Right, um, I did that for myself. Um, I upgraded it and I did not just do the health one and do the heredity stuff as well. It told me that I'm a white man. I know. Um, moreover, though, it told me that I was like, by my heredity, like the whitest white person you will ever meet. It's like English, Irish, Northern European. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> boy, that's a white man. But it's like, if you didn't already know. Um, and uh, but it's not like, you know, it's like you probably have this, you probably have that, you probably have this kind of stuff, but it's all probabilistic, you know, in terms of, um, it's not, you're going to get, one, one, of the, one of the markers that showed up for me, and I can attest to this, is um, a likelihood of two things. I have one of the genes that increases the odds of celiac disease, celiac disease. Curious that I always feel better when I don't have gluten and bread in my diet, isn't it? Isn't it? And um, macular degeneration. Which is like, I just not, it's like an optical, it gets, you know, and it's like wear sunglasses, don't stare at a lot of bright light and, you, and smoke a lot of weed and you should be fine. Not made for kids, <laughs> uh, right? Because <laughs> like you glaucoma, I, you know, um, mm -hmm. okay, I wouldn't say that I engage in that activity anyway, <laughs> YouTube or anyone who knows, right? Um, but there it is, but there it is. Um, and so, so macular degeneration and celiac disease. So, um, but it's not like you're going to have macular degeneration, you're going to get celiac disease. It's like, yeah. Typically, people who have this allele have a 47.3% chance of getting, of, of having this, you know, markers of this illness expressed during your life. It's that kind of stuff. You know, everything about the genome is never as cut and dry and pure and simple as Gregor Mendel proposed it to be 150 years ago. Everything about the genome is probabilistic. It says I'm most likely not going to have a bald spot. Yet. <laughs> Yet. Here we are. Here we are. But I do have um, like a higher probability of type 2 diabetes. And my arteries in my body just really, really, really like to latch on to cholesterol. So... This has got to go. This has got to go. You know, um, and you know, all these conditions sort of put together. My body loves latching on to cholesterol. I have a higher chance of type two diabetes. All this kind of stuff just kind of speaks to this. Yeah, I have a higher, you know, heart disease runs in the family. You know, it just just kind of does. And runs in the family does not mean that every guy in my family had a heart attack, right? Many of them lived in their eighties and nineties. My grandfather lived until he was ninety four. He ate bacon and eggs every morning for breakfast. And then he went outside and chopped wood for 10 hours. So it's like, there's there's a lot of probabilistics that go into this. And this is for all of these things, including the cancers, including the cancers. There are many, many, many people who got really bad sunburns when they were a kid that will never get sun cancer. You know, sun cancer? Skin cancer. There are people that smoke every day their whole lives. And it's like, no, I'm good, I'm running a marathon. It's like, okay. Um, so nothing is quite as easy and deterministic as we like. So much so that there are significantly developed lifestyle decisions that we can make, right, that really do actually decrease the numbers that don't decrease it to zero, but decrease the odds of getting unregulated cell growth in our body. Um, and all the stuff that you've ever heard before is probably true with regards to this. 
dark leafy greens, uh, raspberries, blueberries, you know, berries that have a lot of antioxidants in them, you know, lean meat, don't eat a cow a day, probably stay away from overly processed foods, right? All of these things is really reduce a lot of cancer. So the number one thing you can do to prevent um, colorectal, can colorectal cancer, it turns out, is like processed um, meat, like, uh, like the preserved stuff, like salami, bologna, pepperoni, this kind of stuff. A deli sandwich a day is like the worst diet for colorectal cancer you can ever like find in your life, you know? Um, that being said, this is not just go vegan and eat kale all, all the time. I mean, some of the healthiest things you can eat is like salmon, tuna, oily fish, you know, massive omega-3s that just clear out all of the gunk in your arteries, you know, to the good stuff that your body just loves. So. All this stuff was a little bit complicated um, with regard to, okay, am I going to get purple flowers or am I going to get white flowers, right? Because it's like the truth of the genome is very, very different from the Gregor Mendel model that we always talk about in here. But what the Gregor Mendel model does that we typically learn about in Bio 101, it provides a very good framework for how gametes are made, how genes operate, how they pass on from one generation to the next, and a little bit about how they interact with each other. If you really dig this kind of stuff and you're really interested, NOVA does offer a 200 level genetics course, just called Genetics. Science major, want to hear more? We have this lovely genetics course that you can take. Or if you're going to bio major and go somewhere else, you'll take it as a 300 level wherever you are. But it's very, very difficult to escape an undergraduate degree in biology without taking a course actually called like genetics or something like that. Uh, which is fun, but they'll go into more of the complexities there. Sound good? Sounds good. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, this is what Gregor Mendel did. We've heard of Gregor Mendel before, yes? Yeah. Gregor Mendel. Jessica, have you heard of Gregor Mendel before? Yes. Perfect. He was a monk in, I believe, Austria, I think. I can look at you, Kat. You know, he's like... I'm looking, I'm looking for fact checking. He's like, Austria, right? No, you're good. I believe Austria, but I could be wrong. If you could. Because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say no and I'm going to regret it. And uh, he was always into the science. He would be called a natural scientist or a natural philosopher at the time. Um, and what we do as natural scientists, natural philosophers, we go around and we try to make sense of this world in which we live, uh, which is great. And uh, we try to understand all the good things. Um, coming from a very devout religious family, he took the same perspective um, that many of those in his family. Austria. Yes, thank you, Kat. Um, and in his family, kind of did, which is why do we try to understand this natural world? And this is a question that I may or may not, if I, I'm going to say that I did, but I'm just making that up because I don't remember if I actually did or not. It's a good conversation to have on day one of Bio 101. Why do we try to make sense of this world around us? Why do we try to make sense of the biological world and living things? Uh, you tell, why do we try to make sense of this ocean that represents 65% of our planet? It's like, well, there's a good reason right there. It's 65% of our planet. You know, and some of my best friends are biological organisms. So it's like, I, I totally get why I would want to understand that. Um, why, why do we try to understand geology or mathematics? You know, why do we do any of this curiosity endeavor that we do to try to understand this world? And we all have our own answers to that question, right? What is your answer to that question? And it could go anywhere from, I don't know, just natural curious, or I really like plants, or it's like, I want to make a lot of money, or I want to own a house in the Hamptons, or, you know, I mean, you can sort of have whatever answer that sort of is for you, or my parents want me to be a doctor, a lawyer, or an engineer, or whatever it could be, right? We all sort of have this thing that drives us about why we foster creativity in the ways that we do. So Gregor Mendel is like, okay, so what is my raison d'etre, so to speak, uh, as Gregor Mendel trying to figure out why do I want to know about this world around me? And his answer was to understand the mind of God it's himself, right? Like what, what, are the, what, what did God have in mind? Very religious background. What did God have in mind when he built this place, when he designed this place, when he, when he put all these kind of pieces into place? And um, his way of, of answering the question was, okay, I'm going to study the natural world around me, 
And to make sense of this natural world is to make sense of the mind of God, essentially. Um, I would say that Carl Linnaeus said the same thing when he was looking at all the different diversity of life on Earth and developed taxonomy, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, genus, species. Right? He, he noticed that it seems that, that the God of, of Carl Linnaeus seems to be one that likes organizational structure. He likes hierarchies. So he likes his species to make, to, to make genii, and he likes his genuses to be families, and he likes his families to be made order, right? It's like, it turns out the living world around us and the physical world as well likes to be constructed of hierarchies, right? From subatomic particles up to the multiverse. You have a hierarchy, you know, where every level is made of the components of the level below. That's a universal phenomenon of all things, which is kind of interesting. And uh, so what can I learn? What am I good at? So Gregor Mendel's good at botany. He really likes growing stuff. He would say he had a green thumb. And he's pretty good at probabilistic mathematics. So it's like, of course, that's where his natural tendencies went. He, he didn't just like love peas because he loved, likes peas. I like peas as much as the next person does, right? But peas were what he knew. They're what he was experienced with. They were a good model organism for doing experiments with to try to understand specifically um, what observation had already told us generally. So what we had already known for thousands of years. So Gregor Mendel did not invent or discover heredity. We've known that for thousands of years that we represent the traits of our parents. Raise your hand if this does not apply to you. Raise your hand if this does apply to you. Raise your hand if you don't understand the question. Raise your hand if you are not listening. Raise your hand. Just for the sake of <laughs> Just for the purpose. Raise your hand if you're conscious. Raise your hand if you're not conscious. Raise your hand if you're not conscious or not. Um, so, um, where was I? Botany, math, right? So he uh, wanted to understand the mind of God as it exists through heredity. We've known for thousands of years that we represent the traits of our parents. Um, if you were a hunter-gatherer um, starting to experiment with agriculture 15,000 years ago, you discovered pretty early on that uh, pulling a hoe behind yourself trying to get furrows in the ground to plant stuff is pretty hard work. It's be, it'd be better if you had like some oxen or something like that, you know, to help out with that a little bit, that'd be great. And so we start domesticating animals and things like that. And then the process of domestication, we discover things pretty quickly. So this cow over here, this oxen over here is a real jerk. And it tries to kill me every time I get within 20 feet of it. This one over here is like super, super nice. And he takes to the yoke well, um, he likes to walk in a straight line, and he's pretty mild-tempered. Which is the preferred one for helping with farm work? The one that does not try to kill me. Right? So let's breed that one more. And this one, not so much. Um, or we look at dogs. You know, uh, what is the, you know, this dog over, so uh, we're all sleeping together. Sorry, let me rephrase that quickly. We're all sleeping together as a family unit under the African sky in the savannas. Uh, with a fire, because we're a nice hunter gatherer band over here 20, 30,000 years ago. And uh, the fire starts to die out at 3 o'clock in the morning. And once the fire goes out, that's when the lions start coming closer. Right? Mm -hmm. And so we have these other creatures out there uh, in, the, in, the, in the lands that we have decided to call dogs. And um, they're cute, kind of, but they're a little standoffish. But um, it turns out if we can keep them close to us, and if we can like feed them every once in a while, they stick, they kind of stick around a little bit, and they do this really cool thing. In the middle of the night, if something make a sound, makes a sound, it barks and it looks at it. So not only do you know that um, there's something out there when I'm asleep, but you know what direction it's coming from. Is that handy to have around? Yeah. Absolutely. That's how civilization takes hold. It's like the most symbiotic, one of the most symbiotic relationships that humans have with any other organism on the earth is the dog, right? It is fundamental towards early human civilization. Is I need something that works for cheap, that doesn't try to kill me, 
that will bark at stuff in the middle of the night if it gets close. Dog works. Dog works. It's like, ooh, I can make this dog fast. I can make that dog big and tough. I can make this one small and thin. I can make this one. So all of this uh, weird domesticating experiments that we start having, kind of customizing our dogs in ways to, to have them different. I can't think of any real functional use of the French Bulldog or the Pug right now. Um, but some of these are just ferocious. Well, the, some of the smaller ones, like the, the wiener dog, actually dug out animals that were underground. Yeah, well, yeah, it, it was a total dog, dog, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then the pug, I think, was just supposed to be like British royalty. Yeah, it's like, like that, so it wasn't really yeah, let's see that a dog that doesn't do well to represent how well off we have. Yeah. If you can be a pug and still live, you know, you must be high class. Um, uh, but some of these dogs, like the, the Lhasa Apso, you know, I mean, you ever met one? Anybody ever met a Lhasa Apso? They are. How would you describe the Lhasa Apso? Pretty good size. Yeah, 15. Small and aggressive, mm -hmm. right? Um, they're temple dogs, you know, in, in Tibet. It's like yeah. literally guard dogs. And if you ever get in a fight with a Lhasa Apso, <coughs> bless you. Bless you. Uh, you probably get out of it. It's probably going to hurt a little bit, you know, because like they're really aggressive. Um, but then it's like the Chihuahua. It's like, I don't know, you need a, a little aggressive dog you can hear from a mile away. It beats me. Um, oh, those dogs will tear you up. They will. Yeah, those little ones are boys. Yeah, I worked at Animal Hospital, and you know, it's like get the big shepherd coming, one person hold it. You know, mini Dasha and lots of so Chihuahuas, um, Yorkie. Oh, let's get six, seven people. Yeah, you need body armor. Yeah, you need body armor. Trim its nails type of a thing. It was terrible. Hyper aggressive. One yeah. person on the head, one person on each leg, and one on the body type of a thing. Yeah, and wily. So don't underestimate the small dog. Don't underestimate the small dog. Um, so we and we discovered as a human population throughout our history, selective breeding a long time ago. So it's like just the fact that you know we can selectively breed different traits to go higher or lower in representation in the descendants is old news. Um, not just with animals, corn, like corn um, in the Americas. Um, 20, 30,000 years ago, corn used to be this little grass that grew every once in a while. And through selective breeding and planting, you have these big, lush, ridiculous, you know, Monsanto corn ears that we have today, you know, um, which is like, ooh, those are tasty. But that is not what corn used to sort of be. But each year, this corn was harvested and you know, separated the seeds. It took the top 10% of the seeds and the them over there, and you took the other 90% of the seed, you ate them, and then you took the top 10% of the seeds and you planted them. So each generation, you got better and better and better corn, sort of down the line, more productive, easier to grow, faster growing, more calories in it, kind of stuff from when you came in that. So Gregor Mendel, just to clarify the point, was not out there to, con to demonstrate that selective breeding and traits pass from one generation to the next. We know, right? Gregor Mendel's thing was to understand the mathematics behind this and therefore getting some insight into what might be happening in the body to produce the results that we do. In other words, is this predictable in any reasonable way? When we do these breeding experiments with other things, is it predictable at all? Is there any way to actually predict what the outcome is going to be just from looking at the traits of the parents. And so what he would do, um, his model organism was the pea. So he would um, do things uh, with all different aspects of the pea. It wasn't just the pea seed itself. It was like flower color and things like that. So it's looking at flower color. He would take a purple flower and he would chop the stamens off of it. The stamens are the part that produce the sperm, the, the sperm bearing part. And then he would take a paintbrush and he would get the uh, stain of the pollen off. So there would be only carpal, only the egg, the, fur, the female side of the purple one. He would then get a paintbrush and get some of the pollen off the white flower. And he would brush it up against the carpal on the female part over here. So he knew he was getting the pollen from a white flowered plant um, onto the fertilized egg of the purple flowered plant. Then this was growing the peas, and then you take the pea and you plant it, and you see what you get in the next generation. So it turns out if you uh, combine uh, purple flowered pea plants with white flowered pea plants, and you grow the peas, and the peas were all purple. What happened to the white? 
is recessive. That's the question, isn't it? So it's like, what does that mean, recessive? But like, where did it go? Can he get it back? Is it gone for good? How does any of this work? That was Gregor Mendel's question. So it's like, how do you, is there any predictive nature to this whatsoever? And he, Gregor Mendel, determined the answer is yes, you can. So what he noticed was in the previous experiment, take a perp flower, breed it with the white flower, you get the next generation, which is called the F1 generation. They are hybrids. They are all purple. If you cross these with themselves, it's like, we're just taking a bunch of these F1s, cross them with themselves in this big, humongous crossbreeding experiment with the F1s to make an F2 generation. We notice that we do get the white flower back, but it's not like a 50-50 situation. It's almost always, strangely, Jessica, three to one, three to one proportion. It's like 75% of the flowers have this kind of purpley, but then like 25% tend to have this, well, what the white flowers back again. Cool, where did it come from? Where did it go? Why wasn't it here? Why isn't it 50-50? Because these were like 50-50, obviously, because that's how sex works if you've never had it. Um, but it's like, that's 50-50, this is 100%, and it's like three to one, what? So it's like, what must be happening behind the scenes here to produce the mathematical observation that we see? Right, so it's not just like, huh, three to one. He went farther than that. He would, what might a model of heredity within like what's actually going on within us be like to produce mathematically predictable results? Because if the result is mathematically predictable, there must be something happening here that's tangible, meaningful, takes physical form, what's actually going on here. And of course, what he said, the purple flower then is dominant, and then the white flower is recessive, Davion, right? And so that's where we started to get these words, right? When, when, you, when you cross these two things, that next generation is all that one color. That's what they would call dominant. So basically what you're saying is that like the same way how um, uh, humans can carry on certain genes and phenotype and stuff like that, you know, plants can have the same thing. So like one generation, it can just be straight purple, and then... You know, the next one may be purple, but the one after that has possibly that yeah, that white flower gene is in here, mm -hmm. just not expressed. Gotcha, gotcha. Right, so it can skip. It can skip. So would it be possible that the white flower gene was in the original purple as well? Say that slower. Is it possible that the white flower gene was in the original purple? In the yeah, it is. It is. Um, we can get back to that a little bit, um, but it doesn't have to. Um, so the question then, you're about three slides ahead of me, I think. Um, is this homozygous or is this heterozygous knowledge, right? So that's the, um, possibly, one of the assumptions that we're making with just a sentence like, let's assume the answer is no, we still get this. Um, if it was yes up here, it'd be a different result here. Um, it'd be a different, you know, maybe. So it's like, if this is the outcome, what's the result? We'll come back to that question. Perfect. Um, just for more historical context, um, he did look at more than just flowers. He looked at actually all sorts of traits on the pea plant. Um, flower color, yeah. Um, and when he did these experiments, like the one I just showed with the flowers, 3.15 to 1, purple over white. Are the flowers axial? Do the flowers grow off the side, or they only grow at the tips? So what he found here was that um, the axial flowering plants, um, they're more than the terminal flowering one in the F2 generation by a factor of 3.14 to one. Um, are the actual peas themselves yellow or green? About three to one. Uh, is the seed rounded or wrinkled? What is the pod inflated or is it constricted? You can see the peas inside. Three to one. <coughs> Bless you. You get the drift at this point, right? He kept seeing this three to one, like over and over and over and over and over and over in these experiments. Fun fact, uh, I may have talked about this before. The cool thing about peas that we get in the grocery store, yes. Who has ever gone to the grocery store and bought, I don't know, sometimes they say bought, bought peas. Who's ever purchased peas? You ever bought peas? So you have bought peas. Walk me through what you do. So you go to the grocery store. You get a bag. <laughs> you get a bag of peas. 
<laughs> walk out. Walk out. You to pay for it and pay for the fees. Yeah. Right? And then, yeah. and then you, yeah, of course, you pay for the fees. Awesome. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> it sounds like something like you would have probably done. It's like your parents says, go buy peas. Um, very good. Very good. Um, so, and then you open the bag of peas. What does it look like? Frozen. Frozen and uh, small. Were they? Oh, they're round. Yellow? They were green. No, they were green. Yeah. Yellow is actually the dominant pea color. Oh, no. The green ones are the recessive. Right. There's a lot of recessive peas up there. There's a lot of, why is that, do you think? I have no idea. Would you like to eat yellow peas? Oh, because they're not like appeasing to the eye. Correct. Yeah. Oh. Um, this is Del Monte. Back in the, you know, decades ago, it's like they did taste tests, you know, visual tests on, like, frozen vegetables. It's like people like their peas green. Yeah. Okay. So it's like a bunch of... Do you want yellow peas? I would eat them if that's what they look like. Would yeah. you? Would you think, well, that's weird. I mean, a lot of vegetables look weird. But like when you when you eat like wholesome, nutritious vegetables, do you want to do yellow or do you want to be green? I think that's why. Like, like green. Of being green. Yeah, so, so it's like, like green. Because green is fresh, green is, green is jolly green giant. I mean, it's not the jolly yellow giant. It's yeah. jolly green giant. <laughs> when we think of healthy, yeah. we, we think of green. You know, so it's like yellow, sorry. They taste exactly the same. It's like they're perfectly repeated in every way. Except for their yellow. But notice how I just said it. It's like they're perfectly normal except for their yellow. It's like these are actually the perfectly normal ones. These are the weird ones. Right? So yeah, we just like green peas. There's a couple things out there where we just like really dig the recessive uh, trait. We prefer it. Prefer it. So what Gregor Mendelton did, he came up with, this is after like 10 or 15 years of data collection and math and sketching stuff out and coming up with some ideas. What might be a model that describes why we get the traits that we do and the proportions that we do? Uh, let me back one quick slide to bring up one more point. Each one of these things, P shape, P shape, P color, pod shape, pod color, all this stuff like that. Um, he did not refer to them as genes. He called them heritable factors. So it's like color is a heritable factor. Pod constriction is a heritable factor. See, we just call them genes. So, okay. Yeah, it's like, okay. So we, we did a little nomenclatural change on that. So uh, what Gregor Mendel proposed then is that in order for the mathematics to be doing what the, he thinks the mathematics are doing, um, what must be happening, I wouldn't I would say behind the scenes, but it's more like inside the scenes in order to get those mathematical results. Alternate versions of genes which we then call alleles, right? So that it's like the P color, purple and green. So that is the trait is P color. And there are two alleles for that gene. One codes for a green P, the other one codes for a yellow P. Okay, so um, alternate versions of the genes and those alternate versions we call alleles account for the variation. So if you get variation in traits, it's because there are different alleles. Bold spot, no bold spot. Blonde, brunette, redhead, freckles, no freckles. Uh, yeah, whatever, right? Um, there are genes that sort of account for that. And there, each gene has multiple versions that you then call those different versions. So we'd say uh, blood type is an excellent example. There are three alleles for blood type, which is pretty wild to that event. Um, for each character, character of an organism, you inherit two alleles. So you have two alleles for every gene on your body. One of them you got from mom, and the other you got from pop, you got from dad. Does that make sense? What does this mean about what your parents did 20 years ago? Oh, no. Yeah, did, yeah, you don't want to. <laughs> um, one, from, one from each parent. Barry White, a mirror ball, a champagne. You know, we go from there. Two alleles, one from each parent. Okay? One set of chromosomes from mom, one set of chromosomes from dad. 23 from mom, 23 from dad, giving you the 46 that you have. So you have 23 pairs of chromosomes. One set of 23 from your mom, one set of 23 from your dad. Good? 
mom's side ones we say are maternal, dad's side one you say are paternal. If they are different, if the alleles are different, so if you, when you inherit the alleles for this trait from mom and dad, if they're different from each other, the dominant one determines the expression of the gene. The recessive one has no noticeable effect. So this is the green pea, white, white pea, green pea, yellow pea situation. So in some of these peas here, right, two alleles are present, right? One for the yellow pea, one for the green pea, and the dominant one, the yellow pea, is the one we keep saying. Good? Perfect. The two, oh, no, this is a big one here. It's like, okay, that all sounds fine. Two alleles for a heritable characteristic separate, process called segregation, during gamete formation and end up in different gametes. So you have this thing going on inside of you where you make gametes. Gentlemen, you're making sperm. Ladies, you're making eggs. Probably not news at this point. You can write that down if you have to. Women make sperm. Women make eggs, right? Um, the sperm and eggs that you make, the gametes, are not the entirety of your genome. They are half of it. So every cell in your body has 46 chromosomes. 23 from mom, 23 from dad. Um, during the process of making sperm and eggs, they, um, in a couple of different ways, jumble themselves amongst themselves. So you do end up with a full set of complete 23. Um, but the full set of 23, um, some of the chromosomes from mom, some of the chromosomes are from dad, some of them are composites of both mom and dad. So you reshuffle all the genes of the 46 onto the 23, and then you package the 23 up and say, here's a complete copy of one half of a genome. Um, all chromosomes are represented. They're all partially from my mom and partially from your dad and everything is fine. Package together. You're a dude, so we're going to put a tail on it. Um, you're uh, of the female sort, so we are going to package it in a larger cell that has all the organelles present so we can actually get this thing to go. Sperm and egg formation. So if you remember from the cell cycle when we did DNA synthesis and then we did cellular division, remember that? Yes. Like in such classes as the last one or at the beginning of this one. We went through G1 where the cells did their thing. We went through the S phase where we copied the DNA. And then we went through mitosis where we separated the DNA and made two cells. This is different from that. At no point during the cell cycle of the cells in our body did we ever change chromosome count? We always had 46. We have 46 chromosomes in G1. We synthesize a new set in the S phase. So in G2, we have 46 duplicated chromosomes. Previously in G1, we had 46 unduplicated chromosomes. And then in mitosis, we separate the duplicated chromosomes to two cells, each with 46 unduplicated chromosomes. And every step along the way, for the cells in your body that are going through the cell cycle, like we were talking about before, you have 46 chromosomes. When you make sperm and eggs, you don't do that. You go from 46 to 23. Because what you're going to do is, after a long and insightful and complicated interview process, you may, although you are not required to, combine it with somebody else's cell with 23 chromosomes in it to get a new cell that has 46 chromosomes in it, two copies of 23, and you're gonna grow that into a person that's gonna to go to college and get a job and all that stuff. Go to law and have a retirement account, all that kind of cool stuff. So there's cell cycle where we're synthesizing DNA and making copies of cells and things like that. That's not this. This is ovaries and testes. Something different happens. We had take cells that have 46 chromosomes and you end up with cells that have 23 chromosomes in them, half of the DNA, which is a jumble of what you had from your mom and your dad. Okay? And then fertilization happens with a different one to get the 46 back again. So in mitosis and the cell cycle, you do not change chromosome count. It's always 46 in humans at any stage along the way. In meiosis, you do change chromosome count, where you go from 46 to 23. And then through fertilization with an egg or a sperm, you go back to the 46. 
Clear? Mm. Super important. Super important. So when Gregor Mendel is talking about this, two alleles for to separate, segregate during gamete formation, he's not talking about the cell cycle in mitosis. He's talking about this other thing that happens in ovaries and testes. So here we have two chromosomes that have the same uh, genes on them, but not necessarily the same alleles. So you have two copies of every chromosome, right? We just kind of went through that a little bit, 23 pairs. Um, so this is, for example, chromosome number one. And you have chromosome number one from dad, chromosome number one from mom. We would say that these two chromosomes are homologous because the traits are the same along the length of it, even though the states of the traits might be different. So here are two homologous chromosomes. Whichever one in peas have flower color on them. Here's the allele that codes for the purple flower. Here's the allele that codes for the white flower. And they're going to be, because they're both the same gene for flower color, although different alleles, they're going to be on the same location on the same chromosome. So they really are going to be next to each other. Thusly. Make sense? Perfecto. So, this looks disturbingly familiar, like something we've done in the past. Punnett square. So what's going on here, mathematically, geometrically, if you'd like to think of it, here's our purple flower, and this is your question. Here's our purple flower, here's our white flower. From the point of view of the genes and the alleles, what is actually going on here? So Gregor Mendel says, okay, we have two alleles for every gene, um, they might be similar, they might be different. Let's make some assumptions here. Let's make an assumption that both of the alleles are the dominant one for the purple flower. There's your answer to that question. And we will make the assumption, although we don't have to assume this though, that the white flower has two alleles for the white flower. We don't, we do have to assume this. We don't have to assume that. Why do we not have to assume that? Because it can be still recessive with, um dominant and recessive. And if that were true, the flower would be what? Other one. Purple. Purple. We don't have to assume this because if there is a dominant allele here, the flower would be purple. purple. So it's like this purple flower could be a purple flower because it has either one or two dominant alleles, right? So we're like, we're going to assume for now that they're both dominant. We don't have to assume for the white flower because we know why the recessive is a white flower. So we know that it is two recessive alleles. Make sense? Does that make sense? Yes, no? I'm getting a furrow brow. You're looking at me like this. You good? Um, so they're gonna make gametes, they're gonna separate these out, they're gonna make sperm and eggs out of them and all that's fine. So if we have two chromosomes, each with a dominant P, uppercase P on them for purple, and we make eggs or sperm out of them, here's our gamete. It's going to have one of those in there. Great. Likewise, over here, here's our chromosomes right there, our two alleles, the little P and the little P, both good and recessive white. And we're going to put that in a gamete. Perfect. So here it is right there, the single P. We're going to fuse these two things together in an act called fertilization. And we're going to end up with a flower that has different allele combinations here. One dominant allele and the recessive one, purple and white. And because purple is dominant over the white, all the flowers 100% are purple. So those would be a recessive um, phenotype. It has to be both recessive. So yes, correct. Correct. Because in this case, white isn't White, white is not purple, right? So it's like die, uh, like a, a pigment is not being expressed in the flower, and so we get white. There are other flowers where um, a white pigment is actually being produced. So it's like when you combine a red flower with a white flower, this next iteration, do you get red or do you get pink? Right? So it's like there's a blending conversation here. Um, that, that sometimes come in, that's a conversation for a little bit later. This is like the straight, dominant, recessive kind of thing. So what if we actually cross these with each other? So now every member of this breeding experiment has one dominant and one recessive. So half of the gametes we make, half the sperm or eggs, 
are going to be like have this dominant gene in them, and half of them are going to have this recessive gene in them. And that's where the Punnett square comes in. So it's like each time sperm or eggs are made by these things, half of them are going to have the dominant P, half are going to have the recessive. So we're going to have like one of these individuals is here, dominant and recessive represented. Some of them are going to be here, dominant and recessive represented. And then we sort of junk, junk, fill in the fertilization process. So what we end up with is one fourth of the offspring has two dominant alleles. A fourth has a mix, another fourth has a mix, and a fourth has both of the recessive ones. Um, because the ones that have both the dominant and the recessive look the same as the ones that have just the dominant, we get a proportion of three purple to one white. And that's where he recovered his three to one. So the question is like, where's the white flower up here then and the ones that are all purple? It's like, well, there's this allele over here, but it's being overprinted in mass. That's why the dominant one over there. But you can get it back in the three to one proportion when they crossbreed. What do you think? I think it's still kind of weird the fact that we're getting green peas. What are we doing? Green, green peas. Yeah, it is weird. Yeah, yeah it is weird. Pretty weird. You wonder what else? Since it's, uh, what other recessive things we're eating out there? Some words uh, that we use to describe what happens here. Uh, just is just just to be fancy a little bit to convince your parents or guardians that you learn stuff in college. Um, what you see in front of you, the traits that you observe, we refer to as phenotype. That's like phenotype is what you see. The genotype is the genes behind it, and a lot of times they match up. Sometimes they don't. And I'll talk about that here in a second. But when you're talking about purple, white, green, yellow, terminal flowers versus axial flowers, constricted pod versus inflated pod, that's all phenotype. Okay, so when I look, when I look at you out there, I'm not seeing your genotype. I'm seeing your phenotype. Right? Yeah, physical characteristics. Physical characteristics. Genotype is the genes and alleles behind it. And it is not one-to-one. -one. So how many different phenotypes do we have here? We have two, and they exist in a three to one proportion and that have two generation in this case. How many genotypes do we have? We have, yes, then, three. Good job. Um, you have the phenotype where both alleles are dominant. We call that one homozygous dominant. We have the one, this will freak you out, where the both recessive, We'll call this homozygous recessive. And then there is the ones where there's a dominant and a recessive, and we call those heterozygous. Heterozygous. Phenotype and phenotype. How do you get your phenotype from your genotype? Your genes express in the environment as they do, resulting in your phenotype. Um, and so with the genes that I have for whatever trait that I have, celiac disease, the gene that I have, I have a slightly elevated likelihood that I'm gonna end up with celiac disease in my life just because of the allele or two that I have that doesn't predispose me to it, but it increases my odds. So it's like, there's not, in this world, it's like, like five or six of your traits are truly Mendelian. Most of them, it's like, there's a probabilistic relationship between this and this. And sometimes the probability is high, sometimes the probability is low. With the tools that Gregor Mendel had at the time, the only probabilities he could really work with is 100% or 0%, right? So there's a couple of traits here you have that really don't have that much of a bearing on how the environment interacts with them. There's a couple that I can demonstrate to you if you'd like to. You would like to see some? Sure. Yeah. I have a, I have a quick one. Sure. So, but how does the recessive uh, uh, phenotype get chosen if most of everything is just going to be dominant? Like, so how does like... It's all probabilistic coin flip. You would believe how random you are. Yeah, it's it's coin flip. It's it's pure probabilistics. It's just chance occurrence. You know, what are the odds of 
if you have two two quarters um, and you flip them, what are the odds of getting two tails? What are the odds of you have having a doppelganger? My first question, though, if you flip two quarters, what are the odds of getting two tails? 50% on one, 50% on the other, 25%. What are the odds of getting one head and one tail? That is three people that are the wrong answer. So, fifty percent. You can get a head tail on this one, and you can get a head tail on this one. Fifty percent. Two heads. That is twenty five percent. Right. So it's like genetic. Uh, what do I want to say? Fertilization combinatorics is the exact same mathematics as literally the coin flip. Literally coin flip. Blood type is an excellent example of like a purely strictly Mendelian trait. With the exception that there's three alleles, not two. Three alleles, not two. Okay, so you have the A allele, the B allele, and essentially the O trait, which is not actually anything on the cell at all. So it's like you have the A marker, the B marker, and then you have another state, which is like you don't put markers on your cells at all. And that's the O trait, but it's like strict, dominant, recessive, you're this or you're not. It's just in the genes. You get what you get, deal, kind of. Um, whether or not you have a widow's peak. Anybody have a widow's peak? Is there, you know, right there? Yeah, you got one. That's one. You're like, would you kind of be this a little bit? Uh, <laughs> they're delightful. Um, widow's peak, I do not have one. That's just male pattern baldness that I have. Um, fold your hands. Which thumb is on top? If raise your hand if, thank you, it is the left. Raise your hand if it is the right. Okay, so fold your hands. Now do it the other way. It doesn't work too. <laughs> what thumb is on top tends to be a Mendelian characteristic. What? Left is recessive, it? I don't know which one is which, but it's like it's like one of these like known. Who cares from a genetic selective standpoint which thumb is on top? What does that have anything to do? It's like none really. Um, but it's like it tends to be this genetic trait. Like what thumb is on top when you fold your hand? It's like that's the stupidest trait I've ever heard in my life. Really, cat? I mean, really, isn't it? Yeah. It's like how dumb, how dumb of a thing to have in your genes. <laughs> um What's another one? Um, there are some genetic uh, diseases that are pretty brutal, um, that are strict Mendelian. Cystic fibrosis is probably the, the, the most well known of them, uh, which is almost, be careful how I say this, good news, right? With these genetic diseases like this that are like strictly genetic Mendelian kind of things like CF is, it's like that makes them good targets for gene therapy. You know, because like if, if you can fix this condition with the, the tweak of a gene with CRISPR technology, you might be able to actually do something here with this as a like not just like a fix, but like a cure situation. Um, you can go in and swap in a new gene with CRISPR um, to give you a new trans cell transporter that gets rid of CF. You're in good shape. Um, stuff like that, stuff like that, right? So, eye color is like there are at least 11 different genes interacting with each other to give you eye color. So it's like eye color is not one of these simple Mendelian things at all, at all. Um, hair color is the same. It's like, it's just not as simple as this gene or that. There's like a bunch of different genes going on up here for hair color. Why do some of these hair colors change like rapidly? Yeah, it's complicated. I was blonde when I was like, until I was like two or three. Who's this? You or somebody else? My brother. Yeah, it's wild. I mean, this kind of stuff is can be really complicated. You know, it can be really complicated. Which is strange. Handedness. Um, it's close to Mendelian, but not really. Um, something else seems to be going on on top of it. It looks like it might be a couple of genes sort of working together, like right-handed versus left-handed. A couple of genes going on. Um, so, I mean, there's a few things that you got on you that are super predictable from Mendelian genes and others are just like, eye color is just still sort of like a wash. You know, it's like, it's just really complicated. 
like a lot, at least 11 different genes interacting with each other to do that. Wild stuff, Gregor Mendel. So it's like we can learn things about the genome and how genes interact with each other and that kind of stuff from Gregor Mendel's work, but we also don't want to think that that's the last story now because there's all kinds of stuff on top of that, um, all kinds of complexity as well. So we want to take what we can and not overestimate the rest. Sound good? Yeah, sounds good. One, two, Jessica, you ready? Get to it? You want to do it? Do it properly. Bye, everybody. Have a great day. I'll see you on Wednesday. Perfect. Have a beautiful day. It's a beautiful day outside. Go get some sun. Go get some tree pollen in your sinuses.